This is John Whitaker for the Mathematical Analysis 2 class, and this is our 15th video lecture. And today, we want to talk a little bit more about riemann stilges integrals, and we're going to introduce something called a step function. We're also going to talk just a little bit, very briefly, Will, about some series of uh, real, uh, real numbers. And we will talk more about series as we uh, finish up this chapter. Uh, we will move into the series of real numbers, where complex numbers too, uh, which is held in uh, chapter 3 of our text, but we didn't cover that when we did chapter 3. Anyway, let us move on to the content for today. I'd like to start off with a theorem. It says, if f and g are both elements of riemann stilges integrable functions with respect to alpha on a to d, then 1f times g is an element of riemann stilges integrable functions with respect to alpha, and 2, let's call it A, and part B, the absolute value of F will be riemann stilges integrable, and if you take the absolute value of F D alpha, integral of F D alpha, that will be less than or equal to the integral made of B of the absolute value of F D alpha. That's what we have. We want to prove this. <clears throat> this uh, proof is more uh, algebraic and uses facts that we've already done. And when I say algebraic, I mean algebra, where we're going to be squaring something to get the result, along with facts that we've already proven. <clears throat> so here's the proof. We're going to let F be Riemann stilges integrable with respect to alpha and G be Riemann stilges integrable with respect to alpha on A to B. Then, well, the first thing is that we want to show this part A that F times G, F times G is Riemann stilges integrable with respect to alpha on A to B. Okay. Well, the way we're going to do this is uh, we're going to consider the function phi of t equal to t squared. And if you remember, uh, well, first of all, let's note that this is a continuous function, so phi of t is continuous. on R, and we're going to use the fact having to do with a continuous function composed with a riemann steele disintegrable function, making it a riemann steele disintegrable function. So, then, by a fact, P of F of X. I'm going to write that X. Which equals to uh, F squared acting on X. That's what we have. And so uh, since P is Riemann steel just integrable and P is continuous on R. Then this composition is Riemann still just integrable, which means that F squared, I'll just write this in this way, um, is an element of Riemann still just integrable functions on alpha. Okay. So what we're saying, this conclusion of what we just written is to say, so if F is Riemann stilges integrable, then F squared is Riemann stilges integrable. That's what the conclusion of our work is so far. 
Now, since f and g are both Riemann Stewart symmetrical functions, then, by a previous fact, f plus g is Riemann Stewart integral. Uh, minus g is Riemann Stilgis integral because of the constant we multiply by that Riemann Stilgis integral function. So that says f minus g, really it's f plus or minus g, is Riemann Stilgis integral. And so what we have is that f plus g to b squared plus f minus g to b squared. That's riemann steel integrable functions. That's a riemann steel function. Why? Because f plus g is riemann steel integrable. f minus g is riemann steel integrable. And if you have uh, a function that's riemann steel integrable, when you square it, it's riemann steel integrable. So this is riemann steel integrable. f minus g squared is riemann steel integrable. If you add two riemann steel integrable functions, you get something that's riemann steel integrable. So that's what we have. So if I multiply this out, what we have is f squared, I'm not going to write down the independent variable, but f squared plus 2fg uh, uh, plus, and you know, instead of uh, putting plus here, I made a mistake. Let's change this to minus, okay? And still, this will be Riemann steel integral. Because as I had a plus earlier, if you just put a minus one times this guy, it's Riemann steel disintegrable, and it would make it a plus, uh, make it a minus. Okay, so here's what we have: plus g squared. So make that change. Uh, then it would be minus f squared, and then it would be minus two f g plus g squared. That's Riemann steel disintegrable. So we continue with that word, and what we see is we get that 4fg, <clears throat> when you simplify that left hand side, is Riemann still just integrable, is a Riemann still just integrable function. We just want f times g, but, but since this is Riemann still just, if you multiply by a constant, it's going to be Riemann still just. Uh, so 1 4 times 4fg is equal to f times g is Riemann. Is a Riemann steel integral function. And that's what we wanted to show. Okay, so that's uh, part A's, that ends its proof. Okay. For part B, uh, there are really five. For part B, uh, what we do is we want to show that you know, the absolute value of f, with f being Riemann steel integral, the absolute value of f is Riemann steel integral. And then we want to show an inequality involving uh, the absolute value of the integral of f being less than or equal to the integral of the absolute value of that. Well, here again, we're going to consider a different P of T, if you will, that we're going to use in the composition function, and we're going to let it be the absolute value T, which is continuous. Now, here's what we want to do. We're going to let 
CE3 with a minus 1 or CE1, okay, so that, whichever one we need to do, so that um, C times the integral from A to B of F D alpha is greater than or equal to 0. So whatever C will make that happen, that's what we pick. Look, we know that F is in, Riemann still is integrable, and so this is a number. If it's positive, we take C equal to 1. If, if it's positive or greater than 0, uh, greater than or equal to 0, positive or equal to 0, we take C equal to 1. If it's negative, we take C equal to minus 1. value uh, of the integral from A to B of F D alpha okay, is going to be equal to C times this integral from A to B of F D alpha. Okay. And by a previous fact, we can bring this constant inside, we'll say to B of C F D alpha. And that is going to be equal to the integral from A to B of F. That's the value of F, the alpha. And so that is our proof. I should say less than or equal to. Not equal to. Less than or equal to. And the way that I get this is uh, just take the absolute value of this guy. So the absolute value of CF uh, is going to be bigger than or equal to C times F. So I'm replacing this function, let me say, as CF is less than or equal to the absolute value of CF. <clears throat> so in the end, uh, we had a fact about integrals. As a matter of fact, it's a fact I'm asking you to prove, that if you take two integrable functions, CF is integrable, and the absolute value of c times f is integrable. Then if you, if you take these two functions, uh, and one of them is always smaller than the other, the integral of the first is smaller than, or equal, uh, less than or equal to the integral of the second. That's what I'm using uh, right here, but I need to get rid of the c, but remember, this is the absolute value of c times the absolute value of f, but c is either equal to 1 or minus 1, so that's just equal to the absolute value of f. And that's how come I get the result. Okay, next I'm going to write up the definition. It says the unit step function is symbolized by I, uh, is defined by. I of x, it's a piecewise defined function, it's either equal to 0, and that's true if x is less than or equal to 0, and it's 1 if x is bigger than 0. So that's what we would find. So graphically, of course, this is very easy to see. It's 0 here, and it's 1 here. That's what it looks like. That's the unit step function. We will have a fact about Riemann integrability with this unit step function. Matter of fact, the fact is something that's kind of uh, unusual in terms of what work we've done before, is that we're going to do a, be able to compute what the Riemann uh, still just integral is in, in this fact. This fact actually gives us a numerical value for certain types of Riemann steel design integrations. So here's the fact. It says if 
A is less than S is less than B. F is bounded. It's bounded on A B. F is continuous. Theorem tells us in this situation what the actual Riemann Stilgis integral is. We haven't done, had too many facts like that before. Okay, here's the proof. We're going to let A be less than S be less than B, F be bounded on A to B. F be continuous at A. Not A, but S. And uh, let alpha of X be equal to this unit step function evaluated at X minus S. Let's talk about that alpha. Of course, the unit step function evaluated x minus s, that's just going to you to move, if you will, the step function to the left, s units, if s is a positive number. Now let's look at it in terms of its definition of piecewise defined function, not graphically, but algebraically. Now, alpha of x going to be equal to i of x minus s. Okay, what's that? That's equal to zero if what we're sticking in, which is x minus s, is less than or equal to zero, and it's one if x minus s is greater than zero, which is equal to it's zero if x is less than or equal to s, and it's one if x is uh, greater than S. And that's what we have. Okay. Now, the way we're going to... Uh, first of all, we need to show that uh, F is uh, Riemann Stevens integrable with respect to this particular alpha. Now, this particular alpha, you can see that it's uh, an increasing function. Okay? So that's what it is. It's an increasing function. And what I mean by increasing, of course, it could be, uh, you know, we have that greater than or equal to uh, part of it, not strictly increasing. And um, the way we're going to show that F is Riemann Stilgis integral with respect to alpha, it's used that famous fact about uh, if you're given any epsilon greater than zero, you can find a partition such that the upper sum of that partition uh, minus the lower sum is going to be less than epsilon. So uh, here we're going to let epsilon be greater than zero be given. Consider partitions of the form. P equal to x sub 0, which is of course a, x1, x2, and x3. So in our partition, we're only going to have four points. Okay, that's, all, that's all we're going to need to form the right partition. Okay? Only four points, where x sub 0, like I said, is a, uh, x sub 1 is going to be s, uh, x, and that's going to be less than, x sub 3 less than or equal to, I'm just going to say less than, x sub 2, which is less than x sub 3, which is equal to b, that's what we're looking for, those types of partitions.
Alright, now, uh, then the other sum, this type of partition with f and alpha, well, that's equal to the sum as i runs from 1 to 3 of big m sub i, kind of a soup over those sub intervals of the f, times the delta alpha sub i, which, if we expand this, will be with the m sub 1 times alpha x i, or x1, minus, it will be alpha of x0 or a, This should be uh, alpha of x zero, I think. And then plus, it's m sub two. And uh, so this is going to be uh, alpha x two minus alpha uh, x one plus m sub three. And here it would be alpha x sub 3 minus alpha x sub 2. Here. That's what this would be. Now this is going to be equal to, okay, this is m sub 1. Now, alpha x sub 1, so x sub 1 was s in this situation. And if uh, uh, alpha of s is going to be equal to 0. And x sub 0 was a, and a is less than S, and so what we're going to get here is that this is going to be minus 0. Plus, this is m sub 2 times uh, alpha x sub 2, well, that's bigger than S, so that's 1, minus, this is 0, and then plus, here's m sub 3, and both of these numbers are bigger than S, and so we get 1 minus 1. And so this is just equal to m sub 2, big m sub 2. Similarly, The lower sum with such a partition, f and alpha, will be equal to the little m sub 2. So same type of work yields that. Since f is continuous at s, there exists a delta greater than 0 and, I'm going to say something more about delta. So this has to do with the continuity of F. Delta, not only is it going to be uh, greater than zero, but it's going to be less than d minus s over 2, such that for all x in a to b, the closed interval, with that's the value of x of 2 minus s being less than delta, then f of x sub 2 minus f of s will be less than epsilon over 2. So, for all x element of a to b with x sub 2 minus delta, minus s I should say, it's an s. What the heck happened here? This should be less than delta. I made a mistake there. That's a comma less than delta, <clears throat> then um, we have minus epsilon over 2, I'm just working here, uh, it's going to be less than f of x of 2 minus f of s, which is going to be less than epsilon over 2, and so uh, we're going to solve for x sub 2, f of x sub 2, so, uh, which implies that minus epsilon over 2 plus f of s 
So less than f of x sub 2, which is less than epsilon over 2 plus f of x. So, for all x element from s up to s plus delta, that integral, we have minus epsilon over 2 plus f of s. It's going to be less than f of x sub 2, which is going to be less than epsilon over 2 plus f of x. That's going to imply the following. So, <clears throat> little m sub 2 which equals to the continuum, if you remember, uh, over, uh, it would be s to x sub 2 uh, of f of x. This is going to be greater than or equal to okay, minus epsilon over 2 plus f of x. And similarly, big m sub 2. It's going to be, which is equal to the supremum over the integral from s to x of 2 of f of x. Okay. It's going to be less than or equal to uh, epsilon over 2 plus f of x. Okay. <clears throat> so in this partition, I'm not making this very clear, but in the partition, we're going to take uh, x of 2 to be. Uh, such that uh, its distance from S is less than this particular delta. We're going to take that. Then, the upper sum, P, F, and alpha, minus the lower sum, P, F, and alpha, we know that that's by our previous work, equal to big M sub 2 minus little m sub 2, uh, and the distance that they are from each other uh, is going to be uh, less than uh, here the, the subtraction from this guy uh, minus the subtraction of this guy okay, which is uh, less than or equal to uh, epsilon. Okay. And you can make it small enough that we really just have less than epsilon. Okay. <clears throat> we could just say it is, uh, yeah, less than, just have less than. Okay, uh, that gives us that F is Riemann still disintegrable with respect to alpha. Now, what we want to do is show not only that it's Riemann still disintegrable, but what its integral is. That's what we want to do. You know, I went ahead and I said just less than epsilon here. It's because we could have been our work had this be less than epsilon over 4 and, and make it less than that. That's really the details I should have had there. But it's okay. We can alter that. <clears throat> okay. Also... For all the partitions 
of the form P equal to X naught, X one, X two, X three with um, X naught equal to A, X one equal to S, less than X two, less than X three, which is B. We see this is what we said. We see the upper sum, P, F, and alpha, be less than or equal to epsilon of 2 plus F of S. And this is true for all X2 uh, close to S. And what I mean by that, within the delta units. of S. So, the integral from A to B of F, B alpha, which we know exists, uh, which equals to the infimum of these upper sums for all partitions, well, that guy is going to be less than or equal to, let me write right here, less than or equal to epsilon over 2 plus F of S. We could say something about the lower sums as well. Since uh, minus epsilon over 2 plus f of s right, is less than or equal to the lower sum uh, for these partitions uh, with x of 2 close to s, or again we mean within delta units. Then, minus epsilon over 2 plus f of s uh, is less than or equal to uh, uh, the soup of these guys. Of course, that's equal to the integral from A to B of L, D out. Okay. So we have <clears throat> minus epsilon over 2 plus F of S, less than or equal to the integral from A to B of F D alpha, which is less than or equal to um, F of S plus epsilon over 2. And what that tells us is that since uh, epsilon is arbitrary, and this is a true fact no matter what epsilon we have, that tells us then that f of s has to be less than or equal to a to b, uh, b alpha, which is less than or equal to f of s. So we get the results. Then we'll from a to d of f d alpha is equal to f of s. That is the proof of this theorem. Okay, now we're going to talk a quick review, if you will, for series, quick review in terms of our basic information for calculus for this uh, uh, 
um, not a review for this class and that we haven't talked about series before. Well, maybe a little bit of this. Or to finish out this chapter. So as a definition, given a sequence of real numbers, let's call them alpha sub n, uh, then the infinite series of no, a sub n is the sum as n runs from 1 to infinity of a sub n which equals to alpha 1 plus alpha sub 2 plus, plus alpha sub n, uh, n plus and going forever. I don't know why I wrote that down. Right, let's, just, let's just conclude we're going on forever like this. <clears throat> Another definition is associated to a series of real numbers uh, is a sequence. I'm going to symbolize this sequence with S and N. It's a sequence of real numbers, n runs 1 to infinity. Um, so these S of n's, where the way we define a particular term in the sequence S of n is equal to the sum in k runs from 1 to n of a sub k is equal to a sub 1 plus a sub 2 plus all the way up to a sub n. Now, this sequence S of n is called the sequence of partial sums for the series. Um, maybe as uh, k runs from 1 to infinity of a sub k. All right. <clears throat> well, another definition is that an infinite series of real numbers is said to converge to a number S if the sequence of partial sums Sequence of partial sums that's that sequence of S of N's converges to S. All right, um, kind of a 
associated with that definition. If uh, there is no number, S such that the infinite series, let's say n runs from one to infinity of a sub n, converges to then the sum is said to be divergent. Kind of say this in another way. That is, if the sequence of partial sums S of n uh, diverges, then the series I'd like to look at two examples and then we will call it quits for today there. So as an example, if we look at this sum as n runs from 1 to infinity of 1 over n plus 1, um, we want to know whether that diverges or converges and if it converges, what it converges to. For many series, we can't really easily determine even when we know it converges, what it converges to. But in this type of uh, series we can, it's called a telescoping series. And so you might remember this type of series from Cal 2. But we know that if we look at 1 over uh, k plus uh, 1, that is, uh, oh, I'm sorry, I didn't write down the problem I wanted to. It's n times n plus 1. So if you, we're looking at that series. So if you know that n times n plus 1 is really equal to 1 over n minus 1 over n plus 1. <clears throat> so that's for each term. Okay? And let's change these to k's just to help us notationally. So these are k's. Let's check this out. Look, if you get a common denominator here, the common denominator is k times k plus 1. And so uh, uh, I'd have to multiply this by k plus 1, so I get k plus 1. I have to multiply this by k, so I multiply the top by k, so I just get k. k plus 1 minus uh, k is just 1, so it's 1 over this multiplication. Yeah, that's exactly right. All right, um, so uh, S sub n, if you will, we could rewrite this as the sum as k runs from 1 to infinity. 1 over k times k plus 1, which is really equal to the sum uh, this should have an n here, I made a mistake. Sum is k runs from 1 to n of 1 over k minus uh, k plus 1. 1 over k plus 1. And so if we start looking at the terms there, Then S of 1, which equals the sum as k runs from 1 uh, to 1, of 1 over k, k plus 1, uh, that would be in this form would be equal to 1 over uh, 1 plus 1 over, uh, no, minus, 
one half, so we end up getting one half. Okay? One minus one half is going to be concentrated. S of 2 is going to be for the sum as k runs from 1 to 2 of 1 over, instead of this I'll write down 1 over k minus 1 over k uh, plus 1. And that's going to be this part. This part is what we get when we let k be equal to 1. So it's 1 over 1 minus 1 half. And then plus, when I let k be equal to 2, I get 1 half minus 1 third. So you really get 1 minus 1 third as these two guys cancel with each other. And that's what we mean by a telescoping series. A lot of the middle terms are going to cancel with each other. Like a telescope collapses, this is going to collapse. We're just going to be left with those end ones. I'll, I'll do one more. S of 3 is equal to the sum as k runs from 1 to 3 of 1 over k minus 1 over k plus 1. What we're going to get is 1 over 1 minus 1 half plus 1 half minus a third. That's what we get when k is equal to 1. When k is equal to 2, when k is equal to 3, we get plus 1 third uh, minus 1 fourth. Again, these four terms in the middle are going to cancel each other. We're just up to 1 minus 1 fourth. In general, uh, s of n is going to be equal to 1 minus 1 over n. Okay. So the limit as n goes to infinity of s of n, which is the limit is n goes to infinity of 1 minus 1 over n. Well, the limit is n goes to infinity of 1 is just 1, and the limit is n goes to infinity of 1 over n is 0, so we just get 1. So that tells us that this series we were looking at converges to 1. Let me write that up. This series was what we were looking at, converges to 1. Let's look at uh, one more example very quickly. If we look at a series, sum is n runs from 1 to infinity, of minus 1 to n, then we note s of n is going to be equal to the sum as k runs from 1 to n of minus 1 to k. So if we write down some of the terms, s of 1, when n is equal to 1, we only get one term, it's minus 1. s of 2, then we're going to get two terms. It's minus 1 to the first plus minus 1 squared, so well that's 0. s of 3 will be equal to minus 1 to the first plus minus 1 squared plus minus 1 to the third, these two guys that cancel each other, we'll just look for minus 1. S to the 4th is equal to, uh, it's going to be 0. In general, S of n is either going to be equal to minus 1 if n is odd, or 0 if n is even. And so that means that the limit as n goes to infinity of S of n does not exist. And so what we can say is this summation as n runs from 1 to infinity, but minus 1 n diverges. Ladies and gentlemen, that's enough for our lecture today. Thank you very much for your time and patience.